the yeah. the social aspect of of massive uh, like any MMO is really the best part of it. Like, and it's funny because this is my first experience with it. Yeah, the game themselves tend to be kind of a grind, and if you weren't like hanging out with cool folks, then they wouldn't be all that fun. But um, I'm, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let uh, Matt's gonna try and prove to me that the social aspect of Destiny isn't a pile of trash. <laughs> I swear, keep, I keep hearing that it's fun. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't really done. I've just played it all basically a single player, which has given me very mixed feelings on it. Dude, honestly, it's funny because I did exactly the same thing up until like a couple of weeks ago. And yeah. it's it, you're playing a completely different game. Honestly, it's yeah. I, I, I was reading about like I haven't done any of the raids or anything like that. And that's the thing is like I was I was listening to um, a podcast that John sent me actually. And the guy was talking about how. You know, you play single player and you level up and stuff like that, but you're not playing the game until you play the raids because it's it, it's way more like interactive. It's a lot more puzzle solving. It's a lot more platforming, which fucking sucks because fuck yeah, platforming. Why and is there platforming shoots. in a? There was a bunch of platforming the in the expansion too, and I don't understand why you do platforming in first person. It's the fucking worst, and it's and the worst thing is like in the See, raids. This is destiny. Least, you simultaneously yeah. are like it's the best game ever. Also, it's the worst game ever. Yeah. Also, fuck this part of that game. Um. That, do okay. Two things. Do you know what's a? Do you know what's a great game? What's Rocket League. Have you played I, Rocket League? I couldn't do it. Like I, oh. I'm not, I, I, I'm not into sports games. I just I've never been able to do Rocket even, League. Is yeah. The, I don't like sports games or online games or any of that, and I cannot stop playing Rocket League. I well, saw a trailer for it, and it did look kind of dope. I love objective. It's a objective based FPS, right? Like it's Rocket League. Rocket League. No, 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 no. Rocket League is uh, sock. It's three on three uh, soccer with rocket cars that can fly. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> um, you play online against real people in random matches, and matches are five minutes long. And it uh, it gives slow motion replays uh, for when people <laughs> score goals, and it is unbelievably fun. And you can yeah. play split screen on the couch too, which is also really really good. That see, that's cool. That's not something that you can find very much. But um, yeah, no, I just I could the controls were too loose for me, and I just I couldn't get into it. Yeah, give, it, um, give it, give it, like ten minutes of practice, and it's, I did. It's I actually gave it like two hours, and after a while, I'm like, no, nope, not into it at all. I got twenty bucks. I'll buy it. Um, but uh, but oh, back to Destiny it. being awesome. Um, no, seriously, like the raids, it's a completely different world, and it's awesome. I'm trying to like build up a crew of dudes that I know who are not quite as high level because the guys that I'm playing with, they're all like, you know, you get to a certain point and you can like, you know, leave and save and they're like, give me a couple seconds. I got to switch to a different character because they've got like, you know, three different characters, all who are like, you know, level 40 and are they playing on their alt and to, to help you out? Yeah, that's like, good of them. Yeah. But they'll, they'll, all of these guys have three characters that are all maxed out. And because you can share gear, which I didn't know. So you essentially just have to get one to level 40, and then, you know, boom, you're super high level because you get all the sweet gear. Yeah, and then, the I mean, assume, too, you just started playing, but most everybody who's playing now probably started playing at launch, so they've got yeah. a year and a half on you or that's, whatever. That's, that's, that's true. <laughs> Yeah. Oh shit! I heard me. It's fucking weird. Yeah, and All it's right. and it's funny because like um that's that's what happened with these guys. I was talking to them and they were like, yeah, this and this weapon kicked ass until year two when they neutered it and you know because they did so and so and stuff like that. It's actually really interesting listening to these guys do like talk about. Like the all of like the fine details over time and stuff because um they uh they they're the ones who you know they like you said they spent a year and a half playing this game. And so they got to know all of the other areas they really well. When it yeah. yeah, and then they spend a, they spent a year exploring just the the dreadnought, just the one new area, and that's it. And so they know like every fine detail about that place. Yeah, I'm pretty bored with it as it is, but we'll uh, we'll see. I don't know. Like, have you listened to? Um, did you guys listen to Reconcilable Differences podcast? You know what that yeah, is? that's 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 the one that I listened to, and they oh, were cool. talking about. Yeah, history. so that's with uh, John Syracuse and Merlin Mann. And, right. Uh, that's uh, they've spent a bunch of time talking about destiny, and they spent you know all the stuff with all the different currencies that you can do. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. understand anything legendary whatsoever. Um, legendary stuff is cool because it like all legendary stuff. There's like a whole set of um, I forget like abilities or properties or you know special things that like just legendary weapons and legendary armor and stuff can do. Um, and each one of them will usually will have a, a unique like um, attribute 
um, that can, if you use it right, then it'll be really good for PvP or for you know PvE or whatever. Um, shut up! <laughs> Eat a dick. You're the one. You're the one who is talking about this first. You brought it up. Go Sorry, I blacked out for a second there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck you, man. Sorry, I was responding. <laughs> <laughs> responding. Classic. Um, exotic is where it's at because you can take exotic stuff and then you can um, essentially use an pretty, item to completely change it. for a beer podcast. Matt likes his specs like he likes his dancers. Exotic. Hi, there you go. Hi. I see I see what you did there. Because of the whores you see. Here's. Um, and for the record, we're not actually taping the beer podcast yet, so also go fuck yourself. We are taping it. Are we actually, so we're not taping. recording yet. Oh, well, we're shit. broadcasting, but we're not doing the oh, wait, show. So wait, hey, guys, so wait, welcome to the future. Answer, answer, I'm currently yeah, installing Rocket What brewery do you work at now? What? What brewery do you work at now? Uh, Packing House Brewing Company in Riverside, California. So you did leave the brewery? Yes, I did. Uh, I, sent you, I sent you that message on Twitter, I man. I didn't get any messages. Really? Oh, that's weird. Oh, yeah, you um, did. I ignored yeah, it. Yeah, dick face. And then you asked me like 10 minutes ago if I was still up for recording this podcast. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know that there was communique between you and fucking John. So fuck off. Why does this? You're really like digging into me hard, man. Yeah, it's this fire team. This is, this we're is, gonna work through these issues if we're gonna take down the same boss <laughs> again. If we're gonna take down Crota, you guys ever played Borderlands? <laughs> uh, I know. Uh, yeah, I played Borderlands too. It was all right, I guess. It was I played, all right. Yeah, I. I, I didn't used to be very good at video games. I've gotten better at video games, and I don't think I was good enough to play Borderlands the last time I tried it, but I think I could probably do it. Did you play... Uh, after I played Last of Us, that was so much harder than anything else I'd played that it made me way better at video games. Nice. Uh, that That's actually one that I want to play, but I missed out on completely. Oh, that's like the best video game in the world. Like, <laughs> full stop. Like, it's the absolute... Oh, incredible. It's... uh Because the... uh the gaming is fantastic, like the actual like play, because it's the same guys that made um, Drake's Uncharted. Okay. And so uh, it's running, jumping, platforming, but it's third person, so it works. And then the plot is basically the plot from Children of Men. Um, and oh, it's cool. actually interesting and cool, and it super rewards. Um, it, you know, I mean, it's going to seem kind of dated now, but it's got like a whole crafting system thing that you use. And this what came out like four years ago, and this is the game I feel like that made everyone else be like, "Oh, now crafting is like a thing." Right. Um, so you like have to collect shit everywhere you go. So it's all it's a post-apocalyptic um, zombie game. Right. But the way it teaches you to play the game, the open, the cold open. I'm going to ruin the first five minutes of the opening of the game. Nah, go for it. Um, the cold open you play as like a little girl on the night of the zombie apocalypse and then she gets hurt and then you play as the dad and so you learn to walk and then you learn to run and it's a really really good trial uh like tutorial because right. it happens during the zombie apocalypse and it ends um with you get to the edge of town and uh there's a military brigade that opens fire and the girl you were playing as <laughs> dies and uh the father holds her in her arm while she dies as it goes to the cre opening credits and oh, that kind of sets the tone for the game <laughs> <laughs> um hey so we got the um we got the dog patch grand crew we've got the farmers reserve grand crew and the regular dog patch you got an order that you want to do these in um i guess we should probably start I guess I'd say regular dog patch, dog patch, grand crew, and then whiskey. Okay. What or, about the farmers? And then the farmers. Just sort of yeah. Toss that in wherever. Well, I don't want to ruin your dog patch vertical. You got right. Here, that's so. Yeah. So let's just do like the dog patch, the dog patch, grand crew, the farmers, and then the whiskey. You got it. Wait. Shall we? Welcome to Four Brewers. My name is Matt Becker, and as always, I am joined by John Holzer, Jason Harris, <laughs> Greg Nagel. And I'm, um, I'm cramming. That was bad. <laughs> yeah, can we, let's try, let's try let's that try again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I almost said Jason Harris. <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> like Jason Harris. Jason Harris. Right. Welcome um, to four Jasons. <laughs> fuck four yes. I'm like I'm sorry. What? <laughs> like, huh? I think you forgot to say your name last time too. Yeah, didn't totally. You? I'm cramming. <laughs> it's your birthday hangover. Right. Welcome to four Brewers. My name is Matt Becker, and as always, I'm joined by John Olsen. Jason Harris, Greg Nagel. Okay, let's do it. Again. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Jesus Christ. laughs> guys, I think this is going great. <laughs> we're doing, doing, we're doing great, guys. We're what you get really with four well. we, need, we need B roll here. You know what you get with four brewers? Professionalism. <laughs> All right.
Welcome to Four Brewers. My name is Matt Becker, and as always, I'm joined by John Holzer, Jason Harris, Greg Nagel, and uh, we are very excited to uh, once again have, uh, I believe, our first ever special guest, uh, your first return as well, uh, Jesse Friedman of All Manic Brewing Company. What's up, Jesse? Thank you so much for having me. How you guys doing? Great. Good. We are good. Um, and I am super stoked because we have some uh, very special bottles of yours here um but i think we're gonna start with uh your dog patch sour uh what's up with the dog patch here uh yeah so this is you know it's our dog i think we did we drink this the last time i was here too i, th I think we did i think it was one of, we had like five or six of them the last time you were here but uh yeah. i think it yeah so uh it's a it's a great beer it's named after our neighborhood it's sort of our take on a flanders red um so we brew it with uh we have our house uh, sour culture, uh, which is a real lacto forward, real tart sour culture. Uh, then we brew it with, you know, fairly traditional sort of malt blend to give it a little color. Um, and that's aged in used, uh, California red wine barrels with Rainier cherries coming out of the central Valley. Yeah. What's, what's special about Rainier cherries? Exactly. Um, they're cherries, like, you know, like as, like as opposed to other cherries you get, well, that's one thing is like, like, um, one thing that I've um, read about cherries, especially like, you know, Michigan people, obviously, is that there's like so much variety in cherries. And I get that with like apples because we have a lot of apple orchards out here. But like, yeah, I couldn't tell the difference if you have like three cherries in front of me. Sure. You know? Well, so, yeah, the white, ones white ones are the, uh, they're the white ones uh, that'll have like a little bit of blush on them. Uh, and they're really sweet. And uh, we've got a farm that we like working with and we can we get dried cherries uh, from them in this case, which lets us work with them all year, which is really nice. That is cool. Uh, and so we, uh, yeah, you know, we add the the whole dried cherries right to the barrel. Whatever stuck to them is welcome to the party as well um, and allow that to really ferment and dry out. So I wouldn't, you know, it's definitely not like a creek. We're really using the cherry as like an accent point on the beer. And they're using um, like, um, like like a really, a fairly like low, high ratio. Like it, I've, I've worked with um, like fresh fruit and puree before, but like how do you, how do you use dried cherries? How do you know how much to use? Uh, we just picked a number, I think, and uh, we were happy with the result, and so we stuck <laughs> with it. He just yeah, did one cherry like... at a time and then just dipped his finger like, more cherry. <laughs> <laughs> more cherry. <laughs> he calls for cherry. The emperor demands cherry. Well, um, we said that we did this on the show before, and I think it's worth mentioning why we're doing it again, because it's part of kind of a vertical we're doing. Um, vertical? Yeah, yeah, it's a vertical. Uh, it's, vertic or, it's vertical -ish. It's something. Oh, Can wow. we note that those are crazy cool looking cherries? I put a picture up, but like the, I've never seen those before, and the, they're white on the inside. That's weird, right? Yes. Oh, that is. Yeah, I know what those yeah, are. They're neat. Nice. Jesse, can, Jesse can't see the cherries unless he's he in knows the chat. what they look like, though. <laughs> oh, that's, that's true. That's true. Paint that's me true. a word picture, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this is part of a uh, dog patch uh, as being the basis for all of this. We're doing the dog patch sour. We're doing the Dog Patch Grand Cru, and then we're doing the whiskey made by Seven Stills in collaboration with Almanac. That was distilled from Dog Patch, correct? Correct. So when when we uh, did the show before, did we talk about what Dog Patch means? We may have, but I forgot because I don't yeah. Remember. So Dog Patch is uh, it's our neighborhood in San Francisco. So go. it's on the uh, eastern. San Francisco loves its microhoods. Um, so it's on the eastern edge of uh, San Francisco, next to Petrero Hill. Uh, it's next to, we actually, so we're in a building called the AIC, uh, which is American Industrial Center, um, and it houses just a ton of really interesting and creative businesses. There's a lot of arts and a lot of food making. Uh, Magnolia Smokestack Barbecue is in the building, uh, wow. in the South Building from us. Um, and so the, uh, you know, we wanted, really had wanted to name a beer after this area. And so this uh, this seemed like a, a good fit for us. I don't know what it is about the beer that made it fit, but we're like, what do you think about this beer for this name? And it sort of stuck. Nice. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the the, the cherries because um, I know that Russian River has been using dried fruit, but they're like one of the only other ones that I'm familiar with that do. You hear a lot about puree and stuff. So are you adding the cherries directly to the barrel? Or yeah. how, how are you actually doing that? And then you just let them sit as for how long? Uh, in this case, I think it's usually like six to six months or so. Oh, uh, we'll add it to beer that's fairly well matured um, because, you know, the longer you sit on, you'll get a big hit of fruit up front and then it will slowly come down over time. And so we get, we add the cherries to the barrels later so we still get that character, but obviously it's completely dry. Right. Sweet. Because when you're drying out the fruit, uh, you're still holding on to all the sugar that's in there, right? You're just basically losing the liquid. 
So I would imagine eventually, once it's sat in solution long enough, you're still pulling the the sugar and flavor out of it like you would with a fresh fruit. Probably yeah. just take a little longer. Yeah, and there's also a lot of like breakdown with the bacteria on the actual like flesh of the fruit itself, right? I mean, I read about um, Hansen's, uh, the goose blendery in uh, Belgium, and when they do their creek, they say that they add the cherries to the barrel and essentially let them sit there until there's nothing left but pit. Hmm. Right. So we don't, we can't, you know, the cherries are stone fruit. Um, and so that pit in there um, contains a small amount of uh, cyanide? yeah cyanide, which is actually oh. specifically that's the reason mm. I know Russian River got audited in their early days by the TTB in like a whole crazy way. Um, and one of the things that came out of that was an arsenic concern for the pits. Um, certainly with any kind of stone fruit that we use, um, we get questions from uh, the TTB with like our uh, state. We have to do like a whole labeling process that's special for a lot of our stuff. Um, and they'll ask questions about arsenic. And so we make a real point of not using the pits. Um, okay. If you crack that pit open in all stone fruit, including cherries, um, but also, you know, apricots, peaches, you get what's called a bitter almond inside or noyo. Um, okay. And so... You can um, you can denature the poison by uh, cooking it. If you just heat it up, it bakes it. So that's what Cascade does for their noyo. Um, so they crack open the pits, roast them to denature the cyanide, and also it toasts the nut itself and brings out the flavor. And then you can age on that, and it has a real uh, marzipan almond kind of character to it. Isn't, it, isn't that how they make... Um... What the hell's the name of it? Just on the tip of my tongue. No, yeah. Amaretto. Amaretto. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Okay. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I did not know that at all. See? Do Dude's. you think if I drink like a whole lot of old bottles of supplication that I could like slowly develop a poison immunity? <laughs> <laughs> you you could, I think that, I think that idea is, I think that's inconceivable. Like, <laughs> I'd be a, a veritable Rasputin of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then you also have to get shot like nine times and not care. Like, yeah, what if? So, so this beer has got like a ton of wood on the nose, like wooden fruit. Is... Yeah, wooden fruit. It also has, uh, we do blend it with a bit more of an acetic character than we normally do. Um, I'm pretty fastidious about throwing out barrels with uh, acetic notes. Good, thank um, you. But <laughs> oh, that's, I can't like, stand that's it. like finally somebody. Yeah. yeah, and it's um, it's it's actually really interesting. There's been a lot of interest, I think, specifically in the sour beer community in now the different types of acids uh, in different beers. For and sure. Now, um, and so uh, Jeffers from uh, the awesome Barrel Works Firestone Walker Barrel Works program, he's been going around and doing programs uh, called Drop Acid with Jeffers. I, I did that. Yeah, yeah, we um, we actually tweeted him because we did a show uh, a few months back. Well, maybe almost a year ago. It was like almost a year. And yeah. there was a a TA listing on the one of the Barrelworks bottles, and we're like, "What the hell is TA?" And we tweeted at him. He's like, "Oh, it's total acidity," and gave us kind of an explanation. So of yeah, it. yeah, I think we are the reason he started that whole that whole program of the really? sour, the Jeffers drops acid. But oh, I don't know. It, it was us and a bunch of other people asking we'll, we'll, him. Like, we'll take credit for it. Yeah. yeah. What's this TA thing? The You're the Reese's outbreak monkey of uh, titratable acidity. Yep. <laughs> I'm okay with being an outbreak monkey. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but one, so one of the interesting things that's come out of it is actually that, you know, um, you know, just like everything else, you know, around palates, everyone has different levels of sensitivity to different things. You know, different people can smell diacetyl a mile away. Other people can't taste it at all. Um, same thing with the different types of acids. And what we've, they, you know, they've definitely found is there's a little bit of acetic uh, in just about everything right. uh, coming out of a sour beer program. Um, and in fact, acetic in the blend below the no standard taste threshold um, is almost mandatory for a great beer. Um, that really? With abs, 100%. That just lactic alone um, is thin and lacks complexity. It's flabby. Um, and that, yeah. And then a little bit of acetic uh, really coming in Spice below it. the taste threshold opens it up, you know, in an almost complete, you know. And so we tasted actually, what was interesting was in the, the big point was to compare against pH. So pH is a different measure of acidity. Um, but in the case of sour beer production, it's uh, probably less useful overall um, is to, we would taste uh, some beers and then we had a bunch of calibrated water with, um, uh, different levels of uh, lactic acid dropped into it. 
Um, and then we would try and taste the beer and calibrate our palates against it and come up with a number. Um, and so we did a bunch in, you know, sort of uh, beers in different, you know, staggered orders. And then the big reveal at the end was, okay, all these had completely different titratable acidities, but they actually all had the same pH and sort of showing wow. how that pH doesn't affect it. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, we had there was um, the water with the lactic with a drop or two specifically calibrated to be under palate of, um, of acetic and then a couple drops of sugar. And that was better than many sour beers I've had in my lifetime was like wow. water that just built to the profile of a sour beer. It was all sort of like, that's kind of disturbing actually. <laughs> <laughs> that, what, what kind of dinosaur they cooked up in this lab. Um, so this being like, you said it was like along the Flemish red end of things, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're going to kind of expect a little bit higher acetic acid levels in like a Flemish style sour versus like, you know, a, a goose type sour or like a, you know, blonde sour, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like it's, it's, but it's nice because until you pointed it out, I didn't really get a whole lot of acetic acid, you know? Um, and so it does really bring like a nice complexity and you're right. The wood, like there's really the, nice wood. And character. The wood French really open. offsets the fruit. I'm not a fan of cherry in life. Like I don't really like cherry oddly in pie, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but cherries as a flavor, I don't like like cherry and beer. I generally don't like, I had a cherry Berliner from that was a Berliner. I like with cherry and I'm like, Oh no, no <laughs> not the cherry. Well, I'm like it's good if you like cherries. Well, cherries also tend to, you know, if you do them wrong, they can get really like medicinal, like cough syrupy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, even when it tastes like cherry, the fruit, I, I'm not super into it, but it blends really well in this beer. Yeah, it, so that's where I was going with the that. Sam Adams cherry wheat, like oh god, that's god. that's <laughs> oh that is just awful. It's Robitussin and Jim cough. Cook's just gonna come punch you in the face. Cough yeah. drops. I mean, it, it is what it says it is on the bottle. So if you're looking for a cherry beer, you're gonna get it with that. It's Ugh. just over the top, though. It's too much the tussin um so I, i'm assuming you're getting your barrels from your napa, napa sonoma like that kind of area right yeah for the most part we uh we buy from a variety of sources we recently have managed to switch over to almost entirely buying from local wineries now nice. uh, which is which is great what they're most interested it turns out is someone that can just make the barrels disappear <laughs> like, yeah, a giant pile of barrels here and we'd like them to be gone like, how is it is i've heard that bourbon barrels have gotten uh, relatively difficult to get but is the wine market getting saturated to that point or is there still plenty of room for people to come in and take barrels out of those guys uh it's not as bad with wine barrels as it is with bourbon barrels at this point um but the price i mean over the last couple of years overall the price has definitely doubled for a used barrel um even like the guys that are you know making planters out of them um are <laughs> paying more money for them um what so like what is like the lifespan of a barrel in your brewery i mean are you, do you are you just reusing barrels like ad infinitum or do you have like a certain flavor that you're looking to get out of them like how does that how does like the the actual barrel itself work like when it comes to flavor yeah we we will use a barrel uh until it doesn't hold liquid anymore for the most part, mm -hmm. or until there's uh, an acetic infection. And obviously, the longer you use the barrel, uh, the higher a risk there is of there being some sort of problem. Um, but we, uh, you know, I think part of the uh, an important skill for a good sour brewery to have is just, you know, we are just ruthless when it comes to dumping beer and destroying barrels. Um, right. Because it's, you know, our feeling is, you know, as far as yeah. reputation goes, whatever money is in that tied up in that barrel, it's never worth the cost of, you know, a long term effect. Damage and control. So, not? Yeah. And so we, I mean, and that's a big, honestly, that's a big part of the reason that sour beer is expensive is just the overall loss. And we build in a fair bit of loss um, to give ourselves, you know, the space from like a business side uh, to make the best possible, best possible beer. Um, so we keep track of how long we're using them for, and we sort of keep make notes on what the flavors are and stuff as we go through them. Um, and so depending on the beer, there's beers that we want more or less oak character in. And so we'll pull, you know, either blend with beers from a batch that was, you know, okay, we know this one has this much new red, red wine. And there's always a fair bit of new, new to us used barrels in a dog patch. No, it's solid. It's it's still in the like puckery sour, like, sour, like it, it hung a little bit, but not white. Well, not being like a huge acid bomb. Um, I've got a of the group. I think I've got the highest tolerance for that. But even yes, uh, you do. Definitely. But I recently found my limit. So <laughs> he can I, drink battery acid I mean, almost. Uh, except for a, a certain kiwi sour that I was drinking was just 
had to go down the drain. And I was wow. like, three ounces, Yikes. three ounces in. I was like, this is good. You know, it's, I like the flavor, but it's man, it's sour. And then like, I got another like three ounces. I had like half of a, a 750 to share. And, uh, yeah. I was like, my chest hurts, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is like right in my sour wheelhouse. I, I'm, I'm really a fan of it. Yeah, it's not, and it's it's inter- it's always interesting for me comparing American like Flemish red type beers to the actual um, like Belgian Flemish reds because even like the your Rodenbach Grand Cruise and stuff like that, there's always so much more malt sweetness involved, and so to have something like this where it's so much drier and brighter, it's a really interesting kind of contrast. Yeah, it's really punchy. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, we don't make any pretensions that it is an authentic Belgian style Flanders. We're basic. We're you know that we're not interested in that. We think it'd be kind of a little pretentious and presumptive to try and even kind of go after something like that. I get real stickler about uses of words like lambic and things like that. Good on you. Um, and, and when, when <laughs> but what I have to say is, so oh. everything coming out of Rodenbach is pasteurized, All right. Um, and so even the Grand Cru is. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I think it's 25% fresh beer, uh, which is fairly, uh, fairly sweet. Um, but when I visited at the end of the tour, um, they give you a sample of what they call fooder beer, uh, which is unblended, uh, straight from the fooder, unpasteurized, you know, fresh, uh, ready to go, right. uh, Ronenbach. And that's incredible. And they don't sell it. And it's a real bummer. <laughs> if we did some sort of like rock tour like four brewers on tour straight from the fooder should be like the tour name uh, <laughs> um that, that's that's, that's an interesting question as far as like the pasteurization because i mean some you know do you think it has like an effect on the like immediate beer itself because i mean you look at i mean the biggest example is you belgium because they pasteurize, um, all, I'm not. Do they? I'm, I think they pasteurize all of their sour beer. I know for a fact that they pasteurize um, at the very Lafalie. Lof- they pas- <laughs> they pasteurize. Yeah, they pasteurize all their sour. And Lauren Salazar, who is awesome, yeah. Uh, you know, they swear up and down that in double blind taste tests, no one can tell the difference, um, and that you know their opinion is that they blend the beer and they want what that beer is at blending to be locked in amber. Um, right and to be to be static and, and that is in my not- experience it is like like i really love litera and la folie and mm-hmm. um drink like a three-year-old bottle next to a new bottle and you can really hardly tell the difference there it doesn't change really over time that it stays pretty stable at least in my experience and Which, that and that bums me out it, it, for good and bad right i mean it sounds like that's their goal right they, they want the product to stay stable for people with beer cellars, it kind of is like, well, shit, I got all this beer that yeah, I'm aging for no damn reason. What's the point? It's not, <laughs> not going to do anything. I know. They've got those huge, like, fooder farm where they can just pick and choose kind of, you know, bulk. So um, I think they can really nail in their, their you know, that exact flavor profile year by year. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk know. you talk about having a, a, a catalog of beer to choose from for blending. Like, totally. oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, they've done. A, I went to an event in Portland put on by the Salazars that was really cool, where they brought a keg of La Folie and then they brought like six kegs of unblended uh, Oscar. I think Oscar. They have two Oscar and Felix are the names of the bases. I right. forget which one's the red one. Isn't one's is it red, love? Love one of them too. I think that's just what they call the. Um, they call it like, Felix Love. Uh, so I think Felix is the blonde then, and Oscar is the. Junk. Love is just the secret ingredient that they put into every beer. Ah, oh, that's what. It oh, yeah. God, I get so mad at podcasters when they guess about almanac facts, and now I'm doing it to another. Brewery. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have you on. <sighs> yeah, we just, um, so we just they, uh, they brought they brought yeah. unblended, and they let us taste it. And then actually, what we did was you tasted everything, and then you built sample blends yourself. Um, and then you brought, you wrote down your recipe blend and brought it up and they blended you a growler to take home of your personalized creation of a lawfully blend. Cool. Right. Oh, that's it really cool. Really cool event. I love that. Yeah. Love is the name for fooder number three. Oh, so I, uh, that's, all. we were all <laughs> wrong, that's but number one in their hearts. <laughs> um, but Oscar and Felix are other names. I do know that. So we just cracked the uh, the dog patch grand crew here. So um, like right off the bat, the color of this stuff is insane. Yeah, I was gonna note the other one didn't take on much of a redness from the cherry. Although looking at pictures of the cherries, they're not all that red. And it's got like a nice. Pink but this head. beer is got a big red character. Yeah, the head's like pink, 
pale pink. Yeah, like this is insane. What's the story with this? Uh, so both the Grand Cru, so their new beers, we are just incredibly super, super excited to um, to to make them. Um, you know, the inspiration for these beers was we wanted to make to make beers that were really celebratory and something special um, and sort of represented trying to move in a new direction. And so uh, for these, they're both uh, beer wine hybrids. Um, so both there's a red and a white. The dog patch is based on our Flanders red base recipe. Oh, and, wow. Uh, you can taste it too. Oh, my yeah. God. So, so it's essentially 30% red wine, uh, red wine grapes. Um, yeah, you can. That really comes so, through in a really big way. So we brewed. Good way an imperial version of uh we brewed an imperial version of the uh bait of our dog patch flanders red base um and then we got sourced uh you know just extra brand new super exciting great french oak barrels um and then we partnered uh with a winemaker a guy named paul einbaum um he is the psalm and blends wine and run, creates wine and at a restaurant called francis and octavia in San Francisco, um, and he creates custom blends for their, they have draft wine that they sell by the ounce there. Um, <laughs> and so he has his own label as well. And so he worked with us in sourcing. So we sourced, in this case, red wine grapes that were pressed and allowed to sit on the skin to create flavor. And then we blended that into a batch of the beer 50-50. Um, so we created a batch that was 50% grape, 50% barley. Um, and drop that into barrels. And then we drew it a batch that was 100% beer. And we dropped that into barrels. And then the whole thing got blended back together. Uh, both blends land with about 30% red wine grape in the final blend. Mm. Um, and so we're getting, yeah. So we were really looking for a, you know, genuine sort of blending of beer and wine together. Uh, we know uh, the red is 10.5 alcohol, and we know that for a fact because we sent it out to be uh, alkalized since we have like no idea where yeah. it was going to land. Um, but yeah, and so the idea, you know, that color really comes from grape skin is what's creating that color. Um, they, how, do, how long did the grapes macerate for? Uh, a long time. I don't know. That's, <laughs> a part, that's a part of it where we handed it over to a uh, professional winemaker. Uh, right. creating the beers and working with Paul was really fun uh, because we would describe different, I know really nothing about winemaking. Um, I know how to drink wine. Uh, I know how to order beer instead of wine. I know <laughs> how to make jokes at winemakers expense, like God makes wine and brewers make beer. Um, and so uh, we really worked with him to try and create. So we, the base uh, blend of grapes that we used is uh, Zinfandel, Syrah, uh, Tanit, Petite Syrah, and uh, Tempranillo. Um, and so you got a lot of that big Zin, you know, black pepper, you know, really robust wine character. Yeah, a lot of a lot of black pepper, a lot of blackberry. Yeah, and we really wanted to pull that. We wanted a big in-your-face base grape, um, so we could pull that character could survive the beer making process and come out the other end. Yeah, the the sour edge definitely gets um, smoothed down a lot. Like the, the it's there a little bit in the back, but. Um, it, it's definitely, you're, you're getting a lot of that big red wine flavor kind of leading the show. But, um, well, if you were to tell me like red wine and sour beer mixed, I'm kind of like, mm, yeah, I, I wonder, know. I wonder speaking of acids, if, uh, any of that is like tamed by the malolactic, um, fermentation. Do you know if any of that played into that? Yeah, I'm not a winemaker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, but we so, just blend, you know, we tasted, you know, we went through and we tasted them all and we see, saw what we like and, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, what's what's cool about this beer is um, I, on my first sip, it relaxed my shoulders. Like I just wanted to like, <laughs> uh, started, I felt like it just got into a hot tub and I was just like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm sipping, you know, this beer is Jesse, de Jesse, decadently delicious. Jesse, in case you're wondering, that's a good thing coming from Nagel. So. Is it? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's hard. To, uh, uh, yeah. It, I just um, want to like, yeah. It's, Greg had a beer stroke, is giving me a, <laughs> This beer is giving me a back massage as I'm sitting here. <laughs> um, one it's, thing it's that... Good. One thing that hit me right away is, um, yeah, there's definitely acidity, but like you said, Greg, it's super soft, and it also has a really nice tannin to it because, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of whenever you have sour beer, you're going to be getting some tannin from the wood, um, but this it has like that, you know, is it wood or is it grape skin type tannin? It's like you're not really sure, but it's like it's not. I don't want to say muted, but it's fairly gentle, and so it definitely just kind of adds to the complexity of it um the yeah the, this beer does a great job of just having a lot of complementary flavors that 
you know, like it, it's like every time I drink it, you kind of pick something different out of it yeah. and, and, and in a good way, not in like a muddled way, but in like a, it, it's really interesting. It's really cool. I, I'm, I, I'm really liking this beer. Yeah. I mean, even for people that are wine drinkers, I think the way this came off to me at first, it was just really big with that, you know, that wine character on the, on the palate initially. Like I was surprised that's how big it was, but it's not like it's like, oh, this is all wine mixed with some beer and carbonation kind of thing. It's, um, it is very complimentary, like you said. And I think it, it's a great example of how beer and wine can work together in a very good way it's yeah i mean it's the tannic quality like you're saying that mm. and how greg it you it, like, everything you're saying it just the acidity is perfect in this for me i love yeah. it because yeah. uh, i've had a lot of wine barrel beers and beers with kind of a wine compliment to them and, and usually it's like we have like 90 percent beer with like a little bit of wine kiss on there you know mm-hmm. well, yeah this, and this is, is not that no it's like a tag team that that team they really throwing both of the flavors right in there together. And, and I really like how it works. Yeah. The, the, uh, the best, um, comparison that I can make, and obviously this is like a red versus a pale, but, uh, St. Lumbinus like that, that's the only, that's, that's one of the other ones that I've had that the two really, really play well together, you know? Um, when we sat yeah. down to design the beer, we actually, I, I, I pulled together all the grape beers, grape hybrid beers I could find. Um, and so I included both of the Cantillon and when we sat down, I explained, I said, you know, we're going to open a bunch of them. We don't have to finish everything. Um, but we're going to finish these two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like no one's leaving the table till these two bottles are empty. And at right. the end, he's like, that's, he's like, those were just really great. He's like, where can I pick those up? And I was like, yeah, man, I, uh, you're like, I, yeah, uh, eat the East coast. That's where you can pick them up. I had to trade to get, I actually had to trade beer to get those. Wow. Yeah, uh, Cantillon has gotten impossible to get. I've heard the East Coast and, and Canada is what I've been hearing now is where a lot of the like, goose and Cantillon is going now. Canada. We're like, you know, we're really like we're, our sour beers, eh? That's why, we're, uh, that's why we were saying they took our hoser. goose. <laughs> <laughs> they took our goose. We've got to build a wall so they stop taking our goose up in Canada. They're going to build it, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, Jesse, I saw online at one point you mentioned that you were like, like, like revamping or, you know, taking a new look at your barrel program. Uh, what did you mean by that? Oh, it was, uh, I posted that along with a picture of a new, we're doing a, a peach to Bretteville, which is a peach Brett forward beer. Right. Uh, that we just packaged this week. Um, I just mean that we've, uh, you know, Almanac has grown and its barrel program has really changed. And so we, uh, you know, uh, I don't have any background as a professional brewer and we really came from kind of a very sort of home brewery approach of, well, let's try this and uh, see what what happens. And our approach has always been one that blending, especially with the barrel program, always gave us an extra layer of control to do experiments and then pull it back if it doesn't work. Unlike, you know, you make an IPA or something. Well, now you've added that ingredient and it's done. Right. Um, But that, you know, over the last year, we've just really expanded. We've really changed a lot. We've refined a lot of our uh, uh, the, the way we make the beer. So it's sort of uh, every step of the barrel blending program, we've sort of taken a look at it and examined it and said, okay, why are we doing this way? How did we get to be doing it this way? You know, what can we do to sort of change that or improve it? Um, and I think the result has been starting. And we also, uh, we brought on a new uh, barrel blender, a uh, guy named Philip, who's been doing just awesome work for us. Cool. Um, and it's been great to have another palette uh, getting in there with me and sort of helping put it together. Um, and he comes from sort of a very technical, uh, background, which is perfect. So I can kind of, you know, just be like, you know, I dream of a beer that tastes like this. <laughs> and he'll be like, great, let's put it. Well, sure. I know how to do that. Um, and we're doing a lot more stuff, uh, playing with Brett characteristics in our beer. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, our blending program for a long time has been sort of batch based and a little more homogenous. Here's a batch of dog patch. Here's a batch of this beer here made with this fruit. Here's a batch of this. And now we've got more, uh, different base beers of varying levels of Brett, uh, that we're able to blend together to create a more complex balanced Brett lactic you know, with a lot of our beers. And you're going to see that we did uh Cezanne de Bretteville. That was a good uh, beer, by the way. Yeah, yeah really, really, really happy. You just reminded that. me that uh, um, we should have had that on the show. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that, that you left that at home. I was going to bring one. That wouldn't fall, wouldn't have fallen in with the theme. So. That's true. But yeah, uh, yeah, and the beer. idea behind that beer was really kind of trying to do like a fifty-fifty balance of uh, uh, wet dog and horse blanket, and then like pineapple and mango. 
Um, and I think uh, we really hit the nail on the head. I'm very, very happy with how that beer came out. And so now we're using that sort of Brett platform. So, you know, until now we've been very, very lactic forward leaning with most of our sour beers. Right. Uh, because, you know, that's what we were trying to do. And right. know, we're successful in making them very sour. Um, and we're now sort of diversifying that a lot. Um, so we've got a series of uh, Brett forward beers that we're going to do different fruits with as well. I, I, there's a, been kind of a movement right now, I think, in the industry where there's a lot more Brett forward beer, um, which I like because there's it, there's so many different directions it can go and there's a lot of complexity. I mean, yeah. what are there, like a dozen different Brett strains that are used Oops, in beer? Like 50. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. It's, there's, it's, there's a ton of them. And I mean, there's a, new, like, there's a new Brett strain floating in the room you're in right now if you yeah, want, exactly. care to collect it. You know, I mean, there's... What are you trying to say about me? Sorry, here, my beard. Just, <laughs> we're trying to say that Greg's beard is dirty. Oh, yeah. 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 Can you, oh, you can't imagine. No, no fecal notes to it. <laughs> um, um, and so, uh, but yeah, so we're also doing, you know, and we're doing a lot of that with, uh, we've been playing around with in the hoppy sour space as well, which has been super, super fun. Yeah, I saw that. What did you have so far? You had like the, the Simcoe and a Wakatu? Citra. Yeah, we did, uh, we did a Citra, which was great. The Citra sort of, sm and what's fun is, um, you know, as, as you guys know, um, so much of hop flavor, it comes out of the collaboration with the yeast and that if you change a hop and change a yeast, you'll actually get very, very different hop characteristics out of different yeast strains. And what we found that is incredibly doubly true with, um, when we sort of add the hops into our sour beer program. So what we do is we take, uh, we're blending together our base sour blonde along with some of the Brett as well. Um, we pull that out of the barrel when it's completely dry and done. We put it back into a fermenter and then we dry hop it at a rate of about three pounds per barrel. Oh my uh, God. Jesus. Yeah, man. Like we're really doing it. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, I mean, the thing is, is once you're in the business of throwing away barrels of beer, hops are not that expensive. And, <laughs> yeah, so, I see from that. our point yeah. of view, you know, we're making one, we're making expensive beer and we know that. Um, and, uh, our feeling is, you know, uh, we want to make the best, you know, we start with what's the best possible sort of expression of these flavors and then we backtrack it to make sure we can afford to make it that way. Um, so what, what kind of contact time are you using with those hops? Because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's so many different ways of dry hopping in the industry. Are you do like, you know, putting them in there and doing like a research for a couple of days? Like, yeah, exactly or? right. So we do like a room temperature research and then we'll, uh, crash it, uh, get that hop material out of there and then straight into packaging. Nice. Uh, so we did the Citra, um, and that really kind of tasted just like Citra. I was joking on Twitter the other day, I'm ready for a Citra beer category. I saw uh, that. Since uh, <laughs> Citra is now sort of just Citra everything, and I, I agree. Citra is delicious in everything. There are very few beers that a little bit of Citra doesn't help in. <laughs> As someone who's driving to Kern next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, we did the Simcoe, and the Simcoe was awesome because when I think about Simcoe, I think about pine and like uh, woodsy flavors. And we did this one and it was just, I know, you know, a lot of it has to do with lot, but I think a lot of it has to do with the way the acid component interacts with it. Um, the tasting note we came up with it is that the Simcoe tastes like uh, freshly zested limes uh, in a bag of weed. Uh, really? What we think it tastes like, yeah. Um, and it was really, really fun. And yeah, it was really kind of real tropical. Um, and then we did Wakatu oh. and the uh, tasting note for that is it smells like Ecto Cooler. <laughs> <laughs> like it's really kind of like smarties candies um which is a real new sort of new zealand kind of character and then some orange peel and tangerine peel and citrus right. um and then we just just now uh the latest is we packaged um uh with mandarina um nice. and that's super fun we're getting guava pineapple tangerine peel you know so Fruity. i'm loving i'm loving the german aroma hops yeah. Could you help a brother out and do like a mosaic one, maybe? You know? Mosaic will be out for beer week. Nice. Hey, yeah, the uh, TTB hopefully right. shared that label with everyone, which was. Did great. you um? Did you uh? Did you do you get to choose your own lots of hops? Uh, we did this year. Uh, for the first time, we actually didn't have hop contracts. Uh, until uh, this year is our first year with hop contracts. Well, I imagine so, making a lot of sour beer is not really a necessary thing. No, exactly. Well, you know, it's one of those things where I used to brag that Almanac would never make an IPA, and now guess what our top seller by volume is? Oh, Jesus Christ. Almanac oh, IPA. No. Really? Uh, <laughs> which, if you've been uh, paying attention to my drama on Twitter, I've been in Catalina for almost three months, and turns out Almanac IPA was on tap 10 feet from my room at the, the restaurant at the huh. hotel I'm at. Hey! Yeah. Have you seen a buffalo? No. Oh. I saw some deer. 
You should go. There's buffalo there, I heard. I, I, yeah, I guess. And like bald you, eagles or you, something. You know, at first I thought you were going to make some kind of joke. It was like, have you seen a buffalo? Because I've seen a buffalo high. Or, <laughs> have, you, <laughs> have you seen any moose knuckle? <laughs> Guys, I'm going to break the fourth wall and go get a computer charger. Give me one second here. No problem. All right. Get everything in before I okay. fall fly. You guys defaulted back to a Destiny podcast while it's gone. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's 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 that's, that's our what, final form. That's what we've become. Do we? Are we going to do the whiskey in the middle and then we'll do the? Uh, white? I just wanted to open it to make sure there was no like wax issues or whatever. <laughs> I, I just wanted, a bit I just wanted to open it just to check. I just wanted to see if it was good. <laughs> just to see. Just we can store well, this. Make sure, you know. We no, can, let's do the. Um, yeah, let's do, do the, the farmers next. I love whiskey just as much as beer. I like whiskey, but I'm I don't know anything about it. about it. Um, I should bring you some of that uh that Mosswood stuff. It's actually really oh great. God, you want to know the funny thing about the the Mosswoods whiskey is that it has sediment. <laughs> what? Like, like a lot. How like, is that even possible? Like it's funny because like when I got the bottle, I like, like I picked up the bottle and yeah, I imagine it's like bacteria and shit from, from sour beer barrels. But I like picked it up and it was like hazy. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? I'm surprised then, they, like, wouldn't, it... they wouldn't blend it in, you know, some sort of conical or again, I just use I, I imagine they for did, everything. They, I would assume that they just turned it around really fast. Just crash and, it. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, or like filter it. I imagine it would have been like filtered of some kind, but uh, I really kind of want to just decant the bottle. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but but yeah, it's like, you know, because whiskey can sit forever, but this stuff I'm kind of concerned because, uh, you know, autolysis, because it's, I'm assuming it's yeast and it's sitting in pure alcohol. So, but that being said, it's delicious. I don't think, yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's start this back up again. I do have a nice decanter, so I just like pouring whiskey in there. Nice. Just like, oh look, I'm Mad Men. Yeah, it's one of the crystal ones with the super wide <laughs> base. <laughs> I look actually, I'm Mad Men, I'm dude. Actually, it's funny because I seriously considered getting some of like the the round whiskey glasses with like the, the silver rims. Yeah, I, I have know? those, and I have like a silver tray and like a decanter with a little tag that says uh, bourbon on it. Nice. Um, all right, here, let's start this up again. So next we got the Farmer's Reserve Grand Cru. So I'm assuming this is kind of the same thing, only white wine grapes. Is that correct? That's the idea. So this is 30% Muscat. Ooh. Really, Muscat. That's that's a notorious enemy wine of mine. So let's see how this goes. Oh, you're not going <laughs> to like it. It tastes a lot like Muscat. <laughs> how, how, how is it an enemy wine of yours? Did you have a bad Muscat experience or something? Um, I feel like, isn't that really sweet normally, Muscat? Am I thinking of something else? It's it can be. It's often yeah. used as a dessert wine. It can also yeah. be dry. Um, yeah, maybe dry, dry is more my style. Normally, I've, everything I've had with muscat and it just tastes like I got more diabetes from it. <laughs> <laughs> diabetes, um, diabetes. I'm getting a lot of um, like tropical notes off of this. Yep, that's the muscat. Right, yeah. So it's got yeah, a, a lot of mango. Yeah, a real mango. Uh, I think it has a lot of lychee character as well, um, and, and it is also just you know tons of white wine grape flavor. Um, one of the interesting things we learned is it developed a real um, diesel-y kind of character in the barrel, uh, which we found out uh, in talking is to winemakers. Is a white yeah, wine, right. It's a process created by the white wine. So uh, that dropped out in the barrel, and then we blended it for packaging. We got a little bit of it back in from oxygenation there. Um, so that's actually going to die down in the bottle over time. Although what's really weird to me is if you close your eyes and smell it and think Nelson, uh, it kind of fucks with your head a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because Nelson has that diesel thing too. Like yeah, well, a, a little bit, but I don't know. See, the thing with Nelson that I always get, though, is that it always has, like, you know, that tropical fruit, but then it always has that kind of herbal quality to it. You know, it always has that kind of sort of continental hop, herbal yeah. floral thing. That's, what, that's one thing that I always liked about New Zealand hops is it's, like, a combination of that, like, tropical fruit type thing but it also has that edge of like you know herbal floral yeah thing you with know? this i definitely get like some overripe pineapple like you said lychee or lychee um yeah but none of that there's really, no really hop, nice. that's not hops at all that's all uh so yeast and uh and grape flavors yeah that's awesome so like what was the wow. great process for this because obviously it wasn't macerated for any period of time was it just was it just you know you know de-stem de-stem crush in you go or Pretty much, yeah. Uh, we transported over and we added, uh, we processed it at a winery. Uh, then we trucked it over. 
Uh, we did like a half size batch of the Imperial Sour Blonde base. We got that fermenting. That was like five or six days into fermentation. So we wanted a really good, healthy fermentation before we dropped it. Just a ton more sugar right on top of it. Right. Um, so we dropped that in. And then uh, same thing where we did a batch that was 50-50. We did a batch that was 100% malt. Uh, and then we blended that all together. Uh, and this was specifically aged also. We got uh, some really cool giant punchins, which are basically double size barrels. I love punchins. Um, and they have a lot less, uh, you'll get less oak character, uh, which we we wanted a little bit. You know, we wanted to get a little bit of that like French tropical coconut oak character kind of through. But traditionally, Muscat doesn't really see oak. Uh, so we wanted to be mindful of not sort of, you know, pushing flavors together that didn't didn't go so together. Are you uh, blending the, the wort with... Um, the wine must and then fermenting or is it no it's the juice blending after yeah so uh, are, you, are you are you co-fermenting or are you fermenting either like separately uh co-ferment well so we the, the we get we do like i said so we do a half size batch of the beer so uh in this case it's a hundred barrel batch so we do a 50 barrel batch into the fermenter and get that going half half full and then we pump the grape juice into the actively going beer um, oh, then so that would all get dropped into barrels you're so like you're kind of feed, yeah feeding it essentially exactly yeah so we okay. do that all in stainless and cool. then, then that's a 50 50 blend that's then dropped into the barrels so if you don't mind me asking i'm wondering about your fermentation process just for your sour beers in general are you fermenting with uh, like a saccharomyces strain and then going into barrels and adding bacteria or are you fermenting initially with bacteria like how does that how, how are you guys doing that we do a mixed primary fermentation in stainless uh that we temperature control um and then we will drop that into uh you know we we brew a, a lot of beer um so we'll drop you know we do that in a conical and then we'll pull that off the upper arm and just leave the entire conical there and then we'll pump fresh wort actually on top of that to continue that fermentation so we'll do four or five six turns on a sour batch until it seems like uh, things are getting out propagated and there will definitely be differences between the batches because of that generational shift um, and then we'll drop that so we do a weak and stainless mixed and then we move it into barrel oh okay are you are you like adding any kind of bacteria or anything else to the barrels themselves or is it just you know once you go to the barrels then it's just age and that's it no i mean the primary has everything in it okay interesting and so you're, so you're doing, it's almost like a quasi solera type thing Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's not like it's really we're reinventing the wheel with yeast repitching is really right. what we're doing. Um, okay. But, you know, it's just also trying to, you know, obviously we're using, doing sour beer production and stainless. And so there's a real sort of keep everything nice and contained in one place that we can really control everything. Right. Um, but yeah, so we do a week in stainless and then we move it into barrels. And so those barrels, you know, sometimes they're new barrels, new to us barrels. Other times we're dropping into reused barrels, in which case there'll already be a pretty thriving culture um, that'll be different in that barrel than what's coming into it. Right. And so what do you guys think of the beer well, overall? I was going to say, when I first smelled it initially, it, I don't know, it kind of smelled like cat piss to me a little bit, actually a lot. Catty. Um mm -hmm. And I wonder, since this has so much uh, wine, essentially, in it, or, you know, that grape character you get from a wine, I mean, I could wonder if it needs to, like, decant for a little bit, because the, 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 the more bit. I, you know, um, swirled it around and everything, that went away, and I got a lot of the fruit, and I got what I think it's supposed to smell like. I think coconut was a perfect note for it. I get a ton of mm -hmm. coconut in the nose. But at first, um, it was just something was just like, wow, it, it hit me really hard. Like, that's, that's an, it, it didn't smell bad necessarily. It just had that, like I said, it was pungent. And uh, that's definitely noted in, in a lot of uh, white wines. I don't know about Muscat per se, because I don't drink a lot of Muscat, but um, I'm, I'm going to go on record and say this is one of my favorite beers of 2015. Really? Wow. It's wow. fucking good, dude. Yeah. I it's, just poured a little bit more just to, Matt, when you were off work, you stayed at home and drank a lot of white wine. So I did. What do you think of the <laughs> as the expert? <laughs> <Muscat> Sally. <laughs> <laughs> so by the way, this response at the table of one person saying this might be undrinkable and the other person saying this might <laughs> no. be No, 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 no. No, no, no. But, but I'm saying this might be undrinkable, and then the person next to them saying this might be the best beer I've had all year. I've totally That's basically you know, that's that's the market's response, I'd say, so far. Like, you know, I'm, we're kind of way out there with these. I'm cheesing my balls off right here. Just for it, the record, uh, I'm not, I didn't call it undrinkable. I said no, I got, insinuated I got an, a, a weird aroma that I didn't expect that was 
isn't necessarily a bad thing that I no that longer get. To be fair, that's the, <laughs> that's the market's that's the market's response to our podcast too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, no, all these podcasts taste the same. It's like a punch in your balls. <laughs> no, but all I, all, my point was just that it's been one thing that's been interesting for us is um, whatever people's reactions are to this beer, they've been strong, um, you know, across the board, which has been sort of interesting and, uh, you know, different. And you know, that's, a, that's um, a good thing because it's it's better to have that than just, yeah, it's good. And, yeah, and, like, yeah, seriously. I, I, I taste like, so fucking good, dude. It, it's, it's very interesting. Like, I taste like coconut, like kind of vanilla and lemon. I, I'm getting like a lemon well, yeah, character. I, out I, of get, it. I get a lot of citrus character out of um, it, too, for sure. And, um, hand. with a little bit of heat on it. Yeah, oh, it's fuck you. <laughs> fucking Buddha's hand. Mine. There's, a, man. there's a relatable note for everybody at home. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh yeah, just like that Buddha's hand. It is a little gooseberry yeah. note. <laughs> we make tons of beer with Buddha's hand in it. Yeah. We describe yeah, it as true. Buddha's hand. I always describe it as a lemon crossed with a, a uh, octopus. Oh yeah. <laughs> See? Obviously. So is it rubbery? Uh, <laughs> no, it's well, it's, it's, never had, it's, it's um, saline. If you it's a citrus, it's in the citron family. But if you cut it open, it's uh there's no fruit inside, it's all pith. Um, and it's sweet pith. It's not bitter at all. And so if you've had like citron vodka, that this is what it's made with. So it's uh, really, it's really kind right, of right, right. Little, almost a little tropical. Uh, we it use looks it. crazy too. It's it, it, headline it, it, fruit it, it, in our uh, Farmer's Reserve citrus. No, uh, uh, when it comes to the beer, um, I like, and it's funny because yes, I have been drinking like lots of white wine lately. And it's funny because um, the white wine that I've been drinking, I'm drinking a lot of like um, Sauvignon Blanc and like that kind of stuff. That's like super bright and super acidic. And it's funny because you, like you get a lot of those same wine notes out of this, but this actually isn't as acidic. Strangely enough, this has a little bit, it's a little bit softer. It's a little bit rounder, it's a little bit fluffier, like more oak character, but I think it's really wonderful. Um, I think, well, and it's funny because my experience with, you know, white wine, sour beer, obviously was at the brewery. And um, I think this ranks like right up there, if not being better, admittedly. Yeah, the thing about um, this one, it, as far as the blend between the wine and the beers, you know, characters, characteristics go. You okay, Matt? You know? I'm really not. I'm really not doing well with like the making noise on my microphone. I'm just, I'm just like, what are you trying to? What are you this is a, this slapping, is a good reminder that they're both north of ten percent alcohol. Oh, yeah, there's that too. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry, we've got two more shows. It doesn't too. drink. It drinks like about a six percent. For sure, they're like. Five and a half. It does. For for me, I'm always like, whenever I go, um, I'm not a big wine guy in general, but whenever I go like wine tasting, I'm always like, white side of the menu, don't care. Red side of the menu, I like these. Right. And I'm sticking with that in this, which like the red one, I was really into. And this one, I like, okay, comparatively, but the I drink I drink the red. Well, like, like I was saying, this, for your health. this one yeah. is, I think, balanced well with the beer characteristics and the wine grape characteristics or the uh, Dog Patch Grand Cru. For me, anyway, was definitely more. I got more of that wine grape character from it than you know than the beer character. Like it was in a very big way. It's, so. it's, it's funny because I'm kind of like on like I'm right in the middle between the two. I think it's they're both. Perfect balance. Um, yeah, I think they both have you know uh, a strong wine character, um, but I think they're both balanced out really well. Um, I don't get more of one than another. I think um, the the red one is more the flavors that the flavor notes that it's highlighting are the ones right in my wheelhouse. So that one just hits me right in the mouth in a good way. Right in the mouth feels. Right in the mouth feels. Right in your punching. My mouth feels. <laughs> Got punch, punched in the punching. Hashtag punch in the punching. Also, these bottles. Um, yeah, like, talk about the the, the artwork art. on these bottles. Uh, I remember Jesse. We were we went to uh, what was it Cerebral in Denver during JBF, and you had a bottle, and I was just blown away by the artwork on this bottle. It's like wrapped with awesomeness yeah what, what um you said it was kind of a pain in the dick um, it, well, it, you know uh, it was luckily it wasn't it wasn't my dick um <laughs> so, uh, the bottles uh so you know damien fagan the other uh, co-founder and owner at almanac um and so he oversees and does a lot of the artwork and really drives the entire uh visual identity of almanac and you know that we think that's one of the things that really set us apart for it's sure. a belief that the inside of the bottle should reflect the outside of the bottle and vice versa. Um, and so uh, for us, you know, it was important that we really push the envelope on the packaging and design side to go with it, that, you know, these things are a piece. We have to create something wholly new and really special. Um, so we partnered with, and I always butcher this pronunciation of his name, it's Eric uh, Marinovich. Um, and so he did those hand-drawn labels for like the Goza, the IPA, and the Saison as well. Nice. Um, 
And then we worked with uh, some uh, local screen printer and put, you know, a real incredible. So the entire design, basically everything but the barcode um, is hand drawn uh, for this label. Oh my gosh. Um, and so to create this, com and so the, the screen print is 360 wrap. There's no gutters anywhere. Um, and you know, it's complete head to toe was kind of the idea. We actually wanted to do even more of the bottle than what we got. That was the absolute maximum that screen printing technology allows right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, like, I'm no screen printer, but I'm just like, how, how do they even print this yeah. thing all the way well, around? So I can tell way. you what they did to do it. And if you look very closely, you can find the seams is, um, it's created by a series of vertical strips, um, to create each plate. And so the bottom line, the bottom one right. is one entire strip. The whole body of it is one is one strip, and then uh, the shoulder. You can see there's a couple horizontal breaks. So each of those had to be constructed separately. And when you look at it flat, it's actually a pyramid design to account for the the different. So uh, you can see we actually had to create, and there's some real cool visual trickery to hide these details that I'm now exposing. That's the world. pretty clever. Um, yeah, it's it's a really cool design. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah so, you can see you can see right at the where the bottle starts to turn, um, the, the where it starts to angle. Like and, there, that's like a line right there. Dealing with an issue like that, like and making it look like just one piece of artwork is like that's just incredibly. I mean, I that's don't, talent right there. Dude. I don't have any tattoos, but I definitely want to get this as a neck tattoo <laughs> um, with get... almanac across, you know, written across my Adam's apple. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Now, this is a yeah, sleeve, so, I think, is what and it is. And then, like, the, you the your zip code on the back of my neck would be rad. <laughs> Okay. And I do, do, <laughs> your zip code. <laughs> your zip code. No, no, no. Dog, no, so dog pack zip code. Nine four nine. No, dude, you gotta, gotta get, be on there. No, Greg, you need to get this and then nine four nine on the back. Nine four nine. Nine four nine. <laughs> nine, four nine. <laughs> he lives. He doesn't even live in nine four nine. He's seven one four. I used yeah, to North one County, point. son. Yeah. Nine four nine used to be Irvine at one point where no. he lived. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I mean, we're real into the historical angle too, so it's uh, yeah. It, yeah. It, to me, it reminds me of the um, like old like hand drawn like window fronts. You know, like they they would have drawn on the window of like a store that would be like back in the day before they could just print it. That they'd have oh. a guy come like paint on. You know what's it, yeah, what's and, going on? Like what? And it would be like you know shoes five cents. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that's the vibe I get <laughs> from this in a, in a cool way. I'm she sorry, Pat. Can you she tell me some other stuff in that voice? <laughs> uh, what else you want me to say? My old timey voice. <laughs> well, like I'm I don't know. I got nothing. Hey, uh, we got some uh, whiskey on the table over uh, here. We should probably. Oh, I think it's time we move on, on to move on to the next part of our show. Pound of oranges for a hay penny. Can't pass that up. <laughs> 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 um, we actually do have whiskey on the show next, um, oh, which I think is a which I think is a first. Um, Who, whose idea was this? Like we're gonna do a bunch know, of shows, drink like, some whiskey. I like whiskey. Well, get get you drunk. Um, so this is uh, from Seven Stills. What's the story behind this whiskey here? So it's I can tell you a little bit about it. I think I sh it's important to mention this is a Seven Stills whiskey, much more than an Almanac uh, whiskey. Right. Uh, they uh, so whether or not you like if it's good or bad, they get uh, they get all the credit. Does, where does, it, does um, it reflect on you at all? Where's, <laughs> where's uh, their distillery? So they're based here in San Francisco. They're actually located. Uh, they're currently located in the Dog Patch neighborhood. Oh, cool. um, so it made like such obvious sense that we had to do a Dog Patch, uh, a Dog Patch whiskey since they were here. They're actually just about to open a brewery and tap room space that they'll be distilling and serving out of in the Bayview neighborhood. Oh, cool! Uh, which we're all very excited about. Um, so their whole thing is actually based around um, creating whiskeys out of uh, beers. Sweet. Um, so they've done, they did a, uh, chocolate, uh, chocolate stout, uh, whiskey. Uh, they also did a double IPA whiskey in collaboration with pack brew labs. That's really fun. Oh, the uh, beer world has been borrowing credibility from the whiskey world for so long. It's like, it's about time that the beer world gave back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah. So for this one, we, um, we, uh, created, you know, we sort of collaborated with them and we created a version of the base dog patch recipe. Obviously it would not make sense to distill barrel aged beer. That would be very expensive. Extraordinarily. Uh, and so we created, you know, a special version. We raised the alcohol up a lot to create a, wa a wash, a wash. It's the, you know, every industry has, it has to have its own jargon. So a wash right. is the uh, beer you make the whiskey out of. Um, so we created a base version of it. Um, and then they age in uh, very, very small barrels because um, they're brand new. You know, they don't really want to sit around uh, waiting seven to 10 years for full size barrels to mature. Right. So no, it's, ve uh, it's very woody. 
Yeah. So whiskey aging is a function of contact times uh, time. And so the smaller your barrel is, the more oak uh, exposure there is and the more contact you get. Super nutty on the nose. And oh, luckily for us, this is cask strength too. So. Yeah, I was oh, going to say, yeah. this, this is also very high proof. Which yeah, you can tell. yeah. I, I definitely that was actually, that was not part of the original plan. We just, everyone loved it so much uh, at cask strength that it was sort of agreed that it should stay there. Um, yeah. I'm getting a lot of like black black pepper notes after mm-hmm. this. A lot of floral notes I mean, too. A lot of like red flower. For for me, uh, you said a lot of barrel off of it. I'm getting like caramel and um, big vanilla note, and also like a cotton candy type of thing. Yeah, I get cinnamon too. I get a cinnamon. Lot of cinnamon. Yeah, for sure. Those are all big barrel characters, mm. right? It's so hard for me to get past like the. Whiskey, you can yeah. add a little it's water really to it. Hot. Add a little yeah. water to it. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's I, perfectly acceptable. No, I, I, it is acceptable, and I would encourage it in this case. Yeah, add a couple of drops of water. Even with uh, Doctor Bill, when we did uh, expert drinking, I mean, he explained how to do it and you know what to look for and all that. And even then, it was just like, yeah, good. guys, can I get a little water here, please? <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah, it's like whiskey. I'll see. He's got the fancy. I've got those glasses. Look, isn't that fun? I got a fancy. I got a fancy. I just got these. Oh, oh, I, I mean, oh mine, doesn't, a, mine doesn't have a stem. It just has kind of, it's the same shape of glass, but it's like flat on the is bottom. Is that a stemmed Glen Cairn? Glass? It is a stem, yeah. stemmed Glen Cairn. Yeah, we uh, so it's we almost like this, a grappa glass. Yeah, we have a great uh, flea market here in San Francisco that I found these at. Oh, nice. Even better at a flea market. That's nice dead. legs on that, too. Wow. So yeah. I'm, I'm reading the seven stills uh, page on this. So it's a. Uh, um, they took the matured whiskey and aged it in the almanac barrel. So the barrels for Dog Patch and then the Grand Cru, right? The one we just drank. Hey. Exactly. Yeah. So we actually, uh, it was based on timing. We originally had planned on putting it straight into the Grand Cru barrels and then Grand Cru release got pushed back a couple months. So we were just packaging batch four of the Dog Patch, which we tasted earlier. So we put it in those barrels. And then when we got the Grand Cru barrels, we moved it again. Um, into oh, so so the idea is to really, again, short time, you know, high proof, but to really try and pull out as much uh, of that sort of almanac barrel character that we that we could. So it does definitely have a little bit more acidity than your average um, whiskey would have. Huh. Um, and I think that opens it up in nice ways. You know, it's tough. I think it's a uh, it's it's such a complete transformation that I'm always with distilled things. You know, you, when you add things into like a basket, like a gin basket or something like that, you get a lot more direct flavor. Here, I think it's very transformed. I don't know that I taste a direct connection between the pieces, um, but I think it's fun to sort of see. I think it's a nice whiskey. You I know. think it's I think it's definitely a really great whiskey. Yeah, I mean, if you had the two, which we just did, the two next to each other, I don't know about that, but it's it's a really nice connection and um, as, sto- as it's a, a great story. At the as a whiskey too. too, I think the barrel gives it. Uh, th- there's almost like a little sweet character at the end yeah. that, that you don't normally get out of a whiskey. And yeah. I was gonna say, you know, I, I mentioned uh, cotton candy before, but I would like to rework it into like, have you ever walked into a candy store like in a boardwalk that does taffy? Okay. Yeah. 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 You know that smell like of just like candy being made? Yeah. It's kind of what it reminds me of. Yeah. Nice. I, I get nothing. That's because like that. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. <laughs> here's a Greg, Greg hung out with an alcoholic candy maker. <laughs> yeah. Here's, here's a trick. Here's a trick, John. So Have put some put your hand over Greg. the glass. Okay. And shake it up once. So it splashes the top of your hand. All right. Now then, rub your hands together. All right. Just like you're evaluating hops and give your hand a whiff. Yeah, it's just alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I get, I, I get, I get. Uh, brings really the the wood front and center. Okay, I do get the wood a lot. Yeah, I get a lot. The, of, I get a lot of coffee character too, like a like like medium city like, like city green coffee, coffee, cinnamon. Yeah. Did you give yours a splash of water, John? Because it really, I did. It I, really mutes. I the, put like uh, half, the heat I put bit. the same amount of water as whiskey. So I also drink a lot it of did, whiskey. It so. did mute it quite a bit. So. <laughs> yeah. Guys, keep feeding John whiskey till he likes it. Oh <laughs> no, After I, a while, he's like, you know, I think I'm getting the caramel. Me and Greg here are gonna watch you drink the whole bottle. <laughs> I like whiskey. I could drink that whole I bottle like, myself, probably. I mean, I, I like the overall experience with whiskey, but that's all I can really do with it is an overall thing. I can't break yeah. it down. I'm really, I it, it's hard to break down beer down for me too. So, or hard for me to break down beer. It's just. Yeah, whiskey just just no, not gonna happen. <laughs> with whiskey, it's kind of a process of elimination with with certain notes that are dealt it. Like the barrel notes, you kind of run through those. I, Do I, I have, get it? Yes or no? I have found with whiskey, if I have multiple side by sides and I can like evaluate them at the same time, then I can pick up different notes because 
it's like it's I, obvious, I have ref- obvious contrast. Yeah, exactly. And I have reference points, but when it's just one one whiskey, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah side okay. by side, it helps. Damn um, good whiskey, though. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would this is it really out. nice, guys. Um, someone get John another whiskey. Come on, let's do this. <laughs> Start a whiskey podcast. podcast. There you go. Also, they say <laughs> um, the whisk ass. The what tasting is... notes call it wheat forward. Is there actually wheat in the malt bill for this? Is there normally wheat in the malt bill for dog pet? Uh, I believe so. <laughs> Check. Hold on. Hey, Jesse, you cool should ask the thing. brewer. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, after you cut it, yeah, that definitely cuts down those fusel. I mean, it, you can, and I get a lot of that can, caramel. Yeah, yeah, high proof is uh, like 100 proof I'm normally fine with. 119, that's hot for it's, me. It's, so it's, I was like, high. I had to mellow it out. I normally yeah, don't have to put water in whiskey. Yeah, with I, this one. I do get the caramel from the nose. But that just means that you're getting, you know, more product for your money. Exactly. It goes exactly. It's, it's economical. <laughs> yeah, Never mind the fact that it's more expensive. When you're distilling, you're making this like super concentrated alcohol, and then you have to cut it to whatever strength you want. So... How do you? What do you cut it with? Distilled water. Water. Just, yeah. just water. water. Yeah. Okay. All right. Not yeah. concentrate. Or not. Not, not necessarily distilled. Like some mm. like um, barrel aged water. Yeah, exactly. Barrel aged water. That's not a bad idea. Um, Vitamin water. <laughs> well, they had hop water. I was gonna like. I'm gonna start up a electrolytes. Water. It's what the plants crave. <laughs> so there is uh, there is not wheat in the normal dog patch, but there is wheat in the dog patch Grand Cru. Uh-huh. Uh, and I believe there is wheat in uh, in the wheat. Well. Was that specifically? I mean, it says so on the label. So <laughs> was that specifically because? Well, yeah, I would think because it's going going to become whiskey. So yeah, we, we, maybe, we, wheat's very common in whiskey. Yeah. Well, what's interesting about this though, as a, a spirit, is um, I, I get a very bourbony characteristic out of it, but uh, from the, the to me at least, but I don't think there's any corn in it. But I'm still getting. A lot of that sweet character I'd get out of uh, out of something with a corn. There yeah, is I'm not, corn, I'm not really... but there's not enough. There's nowhere near what you'd find in bourbon. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not really getting a whole lot of sweetness, honestly. Like I, I get almost more of like a um, like a uh, like a Highland Scotch, you know, where it has that sweet honey character. Um, yeah, I get a, a honey for sure. Yeah, where it's a, it's a little like bit a, brighter. Like it's a little bit drier. Vanilla. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so honey that's, and vanilla. That's or like Irish whiskey, like you know, a little bit more like that. Yeah, actually, that is Jameson. that's dead on. Irish whiskey is yeah. exactly exactly. Yeah, what that's the, that's what it reminds me. The flavor profile. I'm it's getting. Pretty good. Yeah, I would seek it out, people. Oh, yeah, I think it's really great. Uh, they, do you know? Do you know what the price point is of this off the top of your head? Or it's not cheap. I paid <laughs> I paid fifty dollars for this that's, bottle. Yeah, I think it's like forty five to fifty something in there. And yeah. and they released five. They released four hundred fifty bottles, so good fucking luck. <laughs> well, I, that's another thing. Um, La Bodega, who has provided beers for our show before, um, they had it, and Kim was very surprised that they got it because she didn't think it would leave San Francisco. So sweet. Um, apparently, you can get it at La Bodega. Apparently, next month, four hundred more bottles coming out from Cask Two and Cask Three in twenty sixteen. Well, they're not I'm, as cool as this. I'm one, reading though. the website. I mean, San right. Francisco has also uh, Anchor. Um, does the silly, yeah, yeah. Hunapera oh, yeah. gin is one of my favorites. Old Petrero, those are good, yeah, good stuff. Yep. Um, well, Jesse, th- thanks again for being on the show, man. We really appreciate you. Yeah, it's good on. to see you, man. Oh, yeah. it's always a pleasure. Yeah, Thank anytime you, you ever want to promote some shit, just let us know. If I had a PS4, I'd go raid with you guys, but um, PC Master Race. <laughs> all right, <laughs> well, good on you. Over my head. Um, where can uh, everyone find Almanac online? Uh, you can find Almanac on Twitter at Almanac Beer, Almanac.com, Facebook, Almanac something. Jesse, Jesse is Facebook. Beer Nosh. Yeah, beer I'm at Beer Nosh uh, on Twitter. And you can find Almanac all over California. We're, right uh, we just launched We just launched Chicago. We just launched in Philly. Sweet. So, uh, find, a, find an ever-growing number of places to get us. Right did, did you guys see that your brewery was on a like a road trip to the hundred best breweries in the country? And someone's like, "Yeah, good luck with Almanac." Yeah, yeah we're always disappointing people like that, but we're working on it. We definitely <laughs> we're trying. We're, we're actively working on making a tap room happen. Yeah, nothing, yeah, no, nothing, nothing to announce yet, you know. But it's uh, hopefully it's coming coming next year. So. We need an Almanac Mecca that we can pilgrimage to. An Almanac. Uh, Almanac. 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 Sorry. 
Sounds yeah. like you're drunk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mecca. I went we go to the All Mecca. Well, if you want to find Four Brewers online, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. You can all find all that information on fourbrewers.com. Uh, if you want to donate to the show, you can go on patreon.com slash fourbrewers, and we would appreciate that. We would also appreciate you going on iTunes and giving us a rating. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want your five stars, four stars, five stars. Five, yeah. five, five stars. Yeah, five stars. five stars. We have we have a one star on iTunes. That's really? Well, really cool. that that person can suck a dick. There's no review behind it. <laughs> so uh, of course, just so. a troll. You know? I wonder who it is. Yeah. It's just the way I feel. All right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse was actually our first review on iTunes. So oh, shout out to Jesse. Probably some other podcast. Yeah, Thanks, yeah, yeah. man. Thanks, Jesse. Hey, I'm, um, I'm going to say it on the podcast right now. Yeah, um, there's a typo in your review. By the way, you might want to go back and edit it. <laughs> that's uh, that's how you know it's me. Yeah. <laughs> and also, while, while we got you, you might want to mention sfbeerweek.org. Yes, you have all kinds of stuff happening for SF Beer Week. Everyone right? should come to San Francisco for SF Beer Week. It's uh, uh, what are the dates? Uh, it starts, I think, the twenty second Friday. Yeah, it's uh, it's third week of January. It's moved up this year because uh, of the uh, Super, Bowl? Super Bowl is gonna totally turn the city upside down in February. <laughs> so. Right. You should come to San Francisco in uh, late January instead. Uh, we'll be doing lots of beer dinners, uh, the SF Opening Gala, uh, Tap Takeovers. We're probably going to do something with the whiskey somewhere. I don't know. It's a very complicated calendar. Sure. Uh, calendar nice. calendar publishes uh, December 1st. Nice. Well, right, well, hey, thanks, Jesse. Appreciate it. Thanks, awesome. man. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us directly, hit us up at feedback at fourbrewers.com and brew the shit out of it. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Nailed that was it. great, man. That was oh, beautiful. Thank you guys. Good show. Thank you for the uh John. I didn't mean to pick on you too much for your uh your review of the uh uh Grant Crew. <laughs> you meant it. That was <laughs> you meant it. It was a good beer, dude.